With the European Union's Northern Strike Offensive having come to an end shortly after the successful liberation of Leipzig in the year 2145, both the EU and Pan-Asian coalition would become locked in a stalemate, neither one mounting any major offensive against the other. At least, none that we know of in the European theater. The Cold War between the two factions would continue, however, as both would spend the next two years fighting over the Earth's remaining land and resources. Unfortunately, intel reports regarding all but one of these final battles are missing any date establishing when exactly they occurred. This means the order in which I present these battles may not be correct, and is going to be largely based off when they were added to the game through patches. In addition, these battles have no clearly stated winner, and so my interpretation of them is highly subjective. The EU forces have set their sights on the expanse in the Arabian Peninsula once known as Highway Tampa. In a desperate attempt to keep their mechanized divisions operational, the EU must claim the surviving oil reserves and seize the only remaining harbor from the PAC control. This would be the second time that two forces fought over control of this region. The first having occurred in the 21st century, when United States military forces were tasked with defending Highway Tampa from encroaching Middle Eastern Coalition MEC, mobile divisions. When EU forces arrived in the region via a Titan, they immediately captured the oil depot, establishing their primary base of operations at the location. The EU also secured a small beach outpost just east of the depot. As soon as the Union had all their supplies and equipment set up, they would move out and secure the rest of the region. When the PAC arrived in the region prior to the EU, they established their own primary base at Shar Mia, which was far to the southeast of the oil depot. This base would receive supplies from a small harbor just to the north. The PAC had their own Titan nearby to help patrol the region and had set up anti-Titan missiles at strategic locations along the two major highways here. The closest point to the west of the PAC's base, along the main road, was the warehouses. Various supplies were stored here, but more importantly, it was the location of the nearest anti-Titan missile the PAC could capture and activate. Just north of the warehouses was the refinery. All oil extracted throughout the region would be transported to this refinery via pipelines. While not the location of an anti-Titan missile, it was still an important point for both sides to secure. While the EU may have taken control of the oil depot, they needed the nearby refinery to actually refine said oil. If the PAC held control over the point, they could deny the EU access to this refinery. The closest point to the south of the EU-controlled oil depot, along the main road, was the storage area. This location was the same as the warehouses, only that the storage buildings were larger. More importantly, another anti-Titan missile was located here. The two highways intersect in the southwest of the region. Here at the crossroads is a gas station. The gas station is where any vehicles, both civilian and military, could refuel and receive repairs. The third anti-Titan missile was set up here. Directly to the south of the gas station was the south checkpoint. All personnel that crossed the river wanting to enter the region, either to work at the facilities or simply passing through, would be stopped at this military checkpoint, their vehicle having to go through an inspection before being allowed to enter the region. The fourth anti-Titan missile was located here. The final point, directly west of the gas station, was the west checkpoint. This served the exact same purpose as the south checkpoint, only that personnel would be stopped on the opposite side of the river, before being allowed to cross the bridge and enter the region. The last anti-Titan missile was set up at this point. Once the PAC had gotten word that EU forces had captured the oil depot, they quickly mobilized their own divisions to move out and secure the vital points along the highways. But the EU and PAC captured their closest respective points, with the EU taking the storage area and the PAC taking the warehouses. Due to its importance and proximity to the warehouses, the PAC sent some of their forces northward to capture the refinery. They did so just in time to see EU vehicles moving across the desert, attempting to capture the point for themselves. Fighting quickly broke out between the two forces over the refinery. While elements of both armies fought over control of the refinery, the rest rushed toward the gas station at the crossroads. The most intense fighting of the entire battle would occur here, 
as tanks and battle walkers on both sides clashed for control of the gas station. PAC squads were able to break away from the fighting at the gas station to secure the south checkpoint. Likewise, a couple of EU squads were able to move across the bridge to the west and secure the west checkpoint. While armored units clashed on the ground, the Titans fought for control of the skies above Highway Tampa. Since the Titan shields protected them from all but damage caused by the Block 3 missiles, the gunships on both sides would focus much of their attention on eliminating armored vehicles and infantry below. The battle would remain largely a stalemate until EU forces managed to secure the gas station. With the gas station under the Union's control, they were able to then shift forces over to take the south checkpoint. By the time the EU were able to capture the checkpoint, the PAC had made a counterattack on the gas station, successfully capturing it. With the gas station acquired, the PAC then tried to retake the south checkpoint, but were unsuccessful. They were driven back to the gas station, where they had to defend themselves from assaults by the EU coming from the south and west checkpoints, as well as the storage area to the north, all while the EU continued to send raids against the refinery. Due to a coordinated multi-prong assault, the EU were able to recapture the gas station for the final time, forcing the PAC to be put on the defensive at the refinery and warehouses. The EU concentrated the bulk of their forces on capturing the refinery, Intense fighting between both factions' infantry units occurred amongst the facility's infrastructure, as well as the nearby stream. To stymie the flow of reinforcements to the refinery, the EU sent a division to capture the warehouses. With the warehouses under EU control, the PAC couldn't effectively reinforce the refinery from the main road, having to instead cross a stream. With the refinery unable to quickly receive reinforcements from the PAC's main base, it soon fell to the EU. With the EU now having control over most of the region and all its anti-Titan missiles, the PAC commander ordered the Titan to leave the battlefield so as not to lose such an important asset. The surviving PAC ground forces performed a tactical withdrawal from their base in the east, which was eventually captured by the EU, bringing the battle to an end. While the EU was able to secure Highway Tampa, it would take some time for the facilities to be repaired and fully operational due to the destruction caused by the intense fighting. In the meantime, EU intelligence reported the location of a PAC Titan manufacturing plant hidden away from the front lines of the region known as Karkan. The EU forces have a chance to severely impact the PAC war effort by taking control of the region and the Titan factory within. Just like with Highway Tampa, Karkand was, in the past, the site of another battle between the United States and Middle Eastern Coalition. EU forces arrived and set up their primary base of operations at a gas station outside the city. This included vital support equipment for the EU commander, who also had his infantry secure and occupy a couple of houses just outside the city's main entrance. The EU would have to capture 8 points to have full control over Karkand. The first point closest to the city's entrance was the hotel. Once a place for visitors to reside, it now acts as a forward checkpoint for the PAC. Various smaller buildings and alleyways provide cover for troops to move through or set up ambushes for vehicles attempting to move up the main road. The second point was the square. This point lies at the end of the main road, featuring a tall building with access to the roof via a ladder. This roof provides a high ground vantage to survey the city from, or engage enemy forces on the ground below. Northwest of the square was the suburb. The suburb acted as a small military outpost for PAC forces occupying the city. East of the suburb was the train accident, so named due to a train that had gotten derailed some time before the battle. The site was where trains would deliver parts and supplies used by the PAC to construct Titans at the nearby factory. Just east of the train accident, across a bridge, was the Gatehouse. The Gatehouse was the main entrance to the Industrial District, where the PAC Titans were constructed. The Gatehouse sat on a hill overlooking the main road below, making it a solid defensive position with which to engage enemy forces from. South of the Gatehouse was the Cement Factory. A small garrison of PAC troops guarded this site, 
with their two Ocelot fast attack vehicles. Just northeast of the cement factory was the warehouse. While not the only warehouse in this district, it was the largest one, housing important parts and equipment used to construct Titans. A couple of barriers with light machine guns mounted on them protected the flagpole near the north entrance of the warehouse. Southeast next to the warehouse, surrounded by a barbed wire fence, was the Titan Factory, which was just called the Factory. This was the largest complex in the district, and the most heavily defended. It was also where the PAC Commander's support equipment was set up. The EU would launch their assault on Karkand in the middle of a snowstorm, so as to catch the PAC garrison off guard. This tactic saw initial success, allowing the EU to surprise the defenders at the hotel and quickly capture the point. After capturing the hotel, the EU forces moved to secure the square. This would prove to be a little more difficult for them, as the PAC were now aware of the EU's assault and had time to take up defensive positions and bring forward their own armored units to challenge the EU's. While not as easy to take as the hotel, the EU were able to capture the square. However, continuing to push through the city would become much more difficult, as by now, the entire PAC garrison was alerted, and taking up defensive positions throughout the city. The Union forces continued to make slow progress through the city. Eventually, they were able to force their way up the hill in the northeast and capture the suburb. Afterwards, they pushed towards the train accident and captured that point as well. Due to the number of casualties they had taken though, the EU were unable to make it across the bridge and secure the gatehouse or any of the other points in the industrial district. Realizing that they simply didn't have the manpower or armor to continue their occupation of the city, and worried about PAC forces from elsewhere arriving to reinforce the garrison, the EU commander ordered a tactical withdrawal from Karken. Seeing the EU forces pulling back, the PAC garrison launched a counter-assault across the bridge from the industrial district. The coalition forces quickly recaptured all their lost points, eliminating any EU troops performing a rearguard action. As the PAC retook the hotel, the last of the EU forces were driven out of the city. With the defeat of the EU strike force at Karkand, the PAC were able to maintain one of their vital Titan production facilities. However, this would not deter the EU from launching more strikes against strategic targets to further hamper the PAC's war efforts. Sometime later, the EU would put together another strike force in the Pacific, and launch an attack on the east coast of China. Operation Blue Pearl was an assault originally executed by American forces during the Sino-American conflict of the 21st century. Its success enabled the US to bring a swift end to that war, and the European Union of the 22nd century thought they could do the same. The EU forces have pushed east, where PAC forces have gathered to make a defensive stand against the enemy. As the main route into PAC territory, this region is a critical location for both armies. For the EU forces, a win will position them for a possible quick close of the war, but a win for the PAC forces will temporarily cripple the EU forces and ensure their survival for now. When the EU strike force first arrived outside the port city, they established their main base at the Industrial Harbor. Unlike American forces in the past, the EU would get to cross the harbor into the city on ice rather than water. Just like with Karkand, the EU would need to capture eight major points to have full control over the city. The first would be the Harbor Control, located directly west of the EU base. A large bunker here overlooks the frozen harbor beyond, ready to oppose any attackers. West of the Harbor Control was the Northeast Refugee Area. This was one of a couple major residential districts in the city, housing refugees displaced by the encroaching ice from the north. The second refugee area was southeast of the first. There was plenty of scaffolding and stairs for any infantry to gain a high ground advantage amongst the buildings here. The southeast refugee area extended west, all the way to the south gate. The south gate was guarded by a single railgun, and would give troops and vehicles access to the main road. This road led northward to the PAC's primary base of operations in the city. Just north of the south gate was the refugee control. This large concrete structure was where military and security personnel would watch over and handle any issues regarding matters within the refugee areas. 
The location also acts as a bunker, with which to halt enemy forces attempting to access the main road behind the control. North of the refugee control was the main complex. This complex was just more housing for refugees in the city. The middle of the complex features a staircase that goes up two levels from the ground floor, making the stack of buildings the tallest of the refugee residential structures. West of the main complex, across the road, were the skyscrapers. Positioned between three skyscrapers, this point seemed to act as a motor pool for unused or broken down vehicles. Alternatively, perhaps more refugees were housed in these buildings. The final point, which was north of the skyscrapers, across a couple of bridges, was the living quarters. As mentioned previously, the living quarters were the PAC military's primary base in the city. Troops were housed in the nearby skyscrapers, while armored vehicles were parked next to them. Support equipment for the PAC commander was located here as well. Knowing that his troops would be most vulnerable when crossing the field of ice between the harbors, the EU commander launched the assault when the weather was foggy. While PAC forces at the harbor control could hear vehicles coming from the east, they were unable to get an accurate size and composition of the force, let alone see them until they were practically on top of the coalition's position. The EU forces were able to swiftly capture the harbor control and rush to acquire the refugee area directly west. EU forces in the south were able to take the southeast refugee area, which was only lightly defended by the PAC. Capturing the northeast refugee area proved more challenging, as the narrow roads made it difficult for EU vehicles to move through, especially while under fire from PAC defenders on the secondary levels of the residential buildings. The EU managed to capture the northeast refugee area, though the battle wouldn't get any easier for them. PAC defenders coordinated their troops from the control bunker, making it the most important but difficult point for the EU to capture, especially now that armor and reinforcements from the living quarters were entering the fight. Both factions would end up trading the south gate and main complex points back and forth, with neither side able to break the stalemate. At one point, the EU managed to capture the refugee control, but at the same time, PAC forces from the south gate were able to retake the southeast refugee area. This prompted EU troops from the complex to make a push across the main road in an attempt to capture the skyscrapers, though they were met with heavy resistance by the PAC. Firefights broke out across the entire city, as squads on both sides attempted to outflank each other using the streets and alleys as cover. After hours of intense and chaotic urban combat, the PAC were able to recapture the refugee control as well as the complex and south gate. While the EU retook the southeast refugee area, they were unable to force their way through the other recaptured coalition points. The battle would come to an end, with the EU strike force having run out of reinforcements, as well as being low on supplies and ammunition. The survivors withdrew from the city back across the frozen harbor under the cover of the fog. From the European Union's perspective, the failure of Operation Blue Pearl meant they would be unable to bring a swift end to the war. Both factions would continue their conflict through the rest of the year, and into the next. In the year 2147, Earth's natural resources are dwindling. Across the globe, PAC and EU forces have been exchanging fire in an attempt to secure these valuable supplies. The most important location of all, the Diamond Mines. These are the last known operating mines in the world. Without these diamonds, the ability to operate an army's Titan core would be lost. At some point during the war, the PAC had managed to capture the city of Yellowknife, the capital of the Northwest Territories of Canada. With Yellowknife under their control, the PAC began extracting diamonds from the mines northeast of the capital. When the EU learned of their presence in the region, they mobilized their own force to drive the PAC from the city, and secure the mines for themselves. Arriving in the capital, the EU established their forward base around the tallest skyscraper, located in the southwest of the city. This gave them control over a couple of monorail lines that passed through the city center toward the PAC base on the other side. Seven points would need to be captured for the EU to have control over the city. The closest point, directly east of the EU base, was the barracks. The first monorail line passes directly over this point. 
Many PAC troops were housed here, ready to defend the southwest half of the city from the assaulting Union forces. Following the second monorail line north from the EU base is the central office. This is where civilian personnel related to mining operations throughout the region conducted their work. Northeast of the central office was the Ice Road. This was the location of a storage building, partially surrounded by a wall and guard towers, which troops could gain access to and use for cover. South of the Ice Road was the Mountain Pass. A small trail leads up the mountain and is only accessible by infantry. A monorail station is situated at the top. Infantry could use this pass as a shortcut through the middle of the city. Southeast of the Mountain Pass and northeast of the barracks were the offices, where additional civilian personnel worked. Both monorails from the southwest of the map led to the loading yard in the northeast. The loading yard acted as the PAC's primary base and was well protected with railguns and other armored vehicles and battle walkers. The yard was filled with shipping containers being loaded and unloaded. Just above the yard was the main bay area. Northeast of the loading yard, behind the main bay structure, was the park monument. This was the last point in the city, with a helipad located right in the middle of it, surrounded by four ruptured gas tanks. The EU commander sought to replicate the success Union forces had during the Battle of Leipzig by attacking the PAC defenders of Yellowknife at night. The EU force even brought in an A3 Goliath, which was the most powerful ground vehicle in their arsenal. The EU split their forces to assault both the central office and barracks simultaneously. The Goliath led the charge up the north road toward the central office, easily taking out PAC defenders along the way. All the major points were on raised ground, that was only accessible by infantry. This meant that armored vehicles and battle walkers were relegated to staying on the main roads. The squad of EU troops inside the Goliath disembarked from the vehicle and quickly captured the central office. The PAC troops at the barracks were initially able to hold off the EU forces assaulting their position. However, with the central office under the EU's control, the Goliath shifted over to support those troops attacking the barracks. With the Goliath's support in suppressing the PAC defenders, the Southern Union attack force were able to make their way onto the barracks and capture the position. Next, EU troops in the north of the city attempted to make their way up the mountain pass and secure the peak. However, PAC resistance at the top was heavy, preventing the Union troops from scaling up the trail. The EU forces then shifted over to try and take the ice road, but again came up against stiff resistance. Meanwhile, EU forces in the south were making better progress through the city, with the support of the Goliath. They were able to capture the offices, which enabled them to concentrate on assaulting the loading yard. With the loading yard under threat by the southern EU force, some PAC troops were pulled from the mountain pass and ice road to help defend it. The defenders at the loading yard concentrate on destroying the Goliath by targeting its weak points. Thanks to said concentrated firepower, the Coalition troops were finally able to eliminate the Goliath and hold back its supporting infantry. While the PAC were successful in defending the loading yard, the EU forces in the north were able to take control of the mountain pass, allowing them to fire down on the defenders below at the ice road. Coalition troops from the loading yard pushed up the hill and retook the pass, but by then, EU forces had captured the ice road. The EU forces in the north and south simultaneously launched a renewed assault on the loading yard, completely ignoring the PAC troops atop the mountain pass. After some intense fighting amongst the shipping containers, the EU were able to secure the loading yard. Now completely surrounded, the PAC troops at the mountain pass put up a last stand before being wiped out by the EU troops, who attacked up both sides of the trail. The last of the PAC defenders held off the EU troops for a time atop the main bay, Union infantry were eventually able to push up and through the bay, capturing the park monument, bringing the battle to an end. The Siege of Yellowknife was the last known battle of the Cold War. While it was certainly a win for the European Union, this victory by itself was probably not enough to knock the Pan-Asian Coalition out of the conflict. The ultimate winner of the war is left ambiguous. 
Both sides may have ended up forming a truce, but it's also possible that they continued to fight across the globe, neither one truly gaining a clear advantage over the other, being locked in a fiery war on an increasingly cold, frozen planet. <laughs>